Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming and being interested in this. So what, what we're going to talk about is how we can make smart contracts useful when it comes to them triggering and being triggered by and triggering external events. Now, in, in our estimation, only about 10 to 20 percent of actual use cases for smart contracts are going to be about tokenization. The other 80 to 90 percent of use cases are going to be about how do I get a smart contract to work in the securities industry, in the insurance industry, trade finance industry, and, and, and many other industries where they basically need to know what's going on externally. So if smart contracts are going to become the dominant form of digital agreement, they're going to, be, they're going to need to be able to interface with data that proves contractual performance. And they're also probably going to need to be able to pay people in the format in which they would like to be paid. Now, this capability isn't something that smart contracts have out of the box. So I think it's important for us to fully grasp kind of the problem we're trying to tackle here. So the problem is that smart contracts themselves, right out of the box, cannot talk to data feeds. They cannot know anything about market prices, external IoT events, and, and really no other data that doesn't already exist on their network. So the, the solution to providing contracts with this very necessary data is basically blockchain middleware. Blockchain middleware is responsible for taking data from the external world and securely providing it to contracts for them to be able to act on it. Likewise, blockchain middleware also creates connectivity to external payments mechanisms, whether that's traditional uh, you know, retail payments or institutional payments, or if those payment mechanisms or other contracts are on other chains, for example, if you wanted an Ethereum contract to pay in Bitcoin, you would need uh, something like a chain link on blockchain middleware that would sign and, and, and broadcast the relevant transactions. Now, I think the important thing to keep in mind when we're looking at, at, a, at a middleware component is that every part of a smart contract needs to be reliable end to end. So if, if only the piece of the, if only the contract code in the middle of the contract is secure and reliable, and we, we, we now live in a deterministic universe where that code is going to execute once it's triggered, we also need to, the triggers to be highly reliable, right? So if the, if the contract code is reliable and deterministic, but the triggers are unreliable, then the entire setup is unreliable, and it's unlikely anybody's going to put any real value into such a setup. However, if you know, if the triggering mechanism is reliable, the contract code is reliable, the payment and settlement mechanisms are reliable, then we, then there is something we call end-to-end -end reliability, which is, in our opinion, what, what would actually be, uh, what we all want a contract to be. It's, it's something that performs all these operations end-to-end -end in a reliable way. So this is really the, the body of work that we're kind of involved in, in solving, is providing this end-to-end -end reliability when it comes to contracts dealing with external inputs and external outputs. I think it's useful to look at some approaches that don't work, and then we can consider some of the, some of the methods that would work. So an approach that we don't think is particularly secure or good is when you have a data source and you have a decentralized computation network, and then you have one node, right? So you have thousands of nodes executing the contract code and the reliability of that contract code being based on thousands of indiv in independent parties executing that code. And then you have this highly secure, highly deterministic contract being triggered by a single node, right? Run by some thir third party, a startup, whoever. Uh, I mean, it's really quite simple. If you don't want that contract to execute, you go after that one node and you take it out and the contract, no matter how well it's written or what, what quality of network it's running on, it will not execute, it would, will not do a state change. It, it, it's, its security is basically compromised at this, this very simple attack vector, which is one of, you know, w one of the main ones we see on externally connected contracts. So then the question becomes kind of what is the potential solution to, to this initial problem? The, the potential solution is we apply the logic of decentralization to the Oracle mechanism, right? To the blockchain middleware, basically, right? The reason we feel that the contract is reliable is it's run on, on many, many nodes, run by independent parties, and there's a method of consensus that proves that they're correctly running the code. We would apply that same logic to the Oracle mechanism, and we would say, we want three, five, 10, 50, 20, you know, however many uh, oracles, all verifying the same input, 
maybe coming to consensus about that input, and that verification of an input across multiple independent parties within the security model of decentralization should uh, provide for us some additional assurance, right? Some assurance beyond there's just one node. So it's, it's basically following the logic of our space and extending it to the Oracle, Oracle mechanism, right? I think it's useful for us to, to just kind of quickly walk through an example to, to put this in perspective. So let's say we're doing a payment for delivery contract where some type of good is arriving and we want to pay for it. So today within Chainlink, what you can do is you can take you know, something like these two data sources, you can combine that data or you can use one as a main data source and one as a backup check or you can have them as you know, multi-step checks. In any case, you can have multiple pieces of data proving that the package has arrived. And then once the package arrives, you're gonna to need to calculate a price. You're gonna to need to calculate the amount of cryptocurrency you're sending to, to pay for the package. In that case, if somebody were to tamper with the data feed that determines the price you're paying, they could massively increase the price or decrease it or do, or do whatever they want. So the approach that we would basically recommend is that you have multiple nodes accessing either one data source or multiple data source to aggregate together the, the piece of data that you need, in this case, price, and give the contract a highly reliable input in terms of this is the price of you know, whatever currency, whether you know, the contract was in dollars and you want to pay in some of the currency or if you want to pay in cryptocurrency. Uh, and then what would happen, you would need also a mechanism to do those payments if the payment isn't happening in the chain's native token. In that case, you could have the contract use chain links and other oracles to pay in retail or institutional networks, or you could have uh, the chain link sign relevant Bitcoin transactions based on the price that, that it arrived at from the data feed earlier, right? So this is, a ge generally speaking, a setup where you have multiple uh, redundant data points, you have a contract reliably verifying the quality and the accuracy of inputs, and then you have that contract making genuinely useful payments to people in the format they want to receive, right? Traditional or, or, or crypto. So now I think, I mean, basically the, the approach that we have to all this is we're seeking to, we're, we're making hundreds of inputs, hundreds of inputs and outputs that people can redundantly combine to either check the quality of an input and or make outputs that users want to receive. You know, maybe a user wants an SMS message from their contract. There's a chain link that'll let you send SMS messages. Maybe there's a user that wants data input and then he wants to be paid in a retail uh, traditional payments format. We, we don't know what these combinations are, but the, the goal of our kind of, the practical outcome of our body of work is a large collection of building blocks that developers can combine and connect into their contracts the same way that web developers combine APIs into their contracts. So basically our thesis is that once developers can have all the building blocks they need to build complicated externally connected contracts, we're gonna see a massive growth in the quality and the value of, of what smart contracts can do. Because the, the limiting factor is this lack of you know, connectivity. Sort of if, if you tried to build Uber without SMS or GPS or, or a payments API, you wouldn't be able to build Uber. You, you can only build Uber when you have all those, all those building blocks to connect with your core code. And in, in our case, we want people to have those in a decentralized way, so the inputs are reliable. So that's, that's kind of the first part of, of our approach to this problem. The, the second part of our approach is layering on an additional level of security using something called trusted execution environments. So a trusted execution environment you, you're probably, some of you are familiar with, is called Intel SGX where they have a secure enclave that basically has its own processing capabilities, its own memory, and its own ability to run code in a, in a secure environment. So I think, I think it's just useful to consider what, what does a trusted execution environment get you in general, and then to look at how is a trusted execution environment particularly useful for off-chain data delivery computation and, and the other things contracts might need. So essentially what a, what a trusted execution environment does is it limits the attack surface area that somebody can go after when, going, when, when trying to, to compromise your application. So without a trusted execution environment, people can have an application running in parallel or in some, some, some system right next to yours that goes after the hypervisor or something in the, in the OS and gets access to your application, knocks it out, does something to it, any number of other concerns. The promise of trusted execution environments is that 
the operating system, you know, virtual machine level things like hypervisors, they can now no longer access your application. Your application is run in a dedicated kind of separate location that has its own processing and memory capabilities that can receive, receive encrypted data, can receive commands, but the actual computation that it does is both private and secure from all the other resources on the system. What, what this practically means for, for, for something like a, like a decentralized Oracle network like what we're making is that no, kind of node operators can now run an Oracle without knowing what it's running. So for, for this approach, we use something called, uh, for this problem, we use something called Town Crier, which is an approach put together by some of the you know, world's top academics in, in, in the field of both blockchains and trusted execution environments. And what the approach basically does is it allows the Oracle functionality I just described to you to function within one of these uh, trusted execution environments, initially uh, Intel SGX. Now, going very quickly through it, how it works is you have a, a contract that represents the functionality of the off-chain trusted execution environment. A user contract makes requests to the contract that represents those services. That's basically how you know, our oracles work, these oracles work. The, the difference is that these oracles are executed within a trusted uh, execution environment, an SGX enclave, that basically takes the commands from off-chain, executes them, uh, takes the commands from on-chain, executes them off-chain by getting data from a data source using the TLS proof to show that that data was received correctly and then putting that, that signed data back into the contract from this secure environment. So that's kind of the approach that um, the town crier provides for us in, in general terms. Now, I think it's useful to consider what, what this approach means. I mean, essentially what this approach means is that you can have thousands of node operators. They can be running an Oracle for other people. And the only thing they can do is shut off their node. So they can't know what they're running. They can't know what the data is that they're, you know, even getting or forwarding sometimes. And they can't, they definitely can't extract any keys or tamper with any of the information that's, that they're running for other people. So what this does is it provides an additional, like one level of security is I have many people ch checking that something is accurate. Another level of security is I have many people checking that it's accurate, but, but also the people running my software can't tamper with it. All they can do is shut it off. And once they shut it off, their participation in the consensus mechanism or, or you know, whatever, whatever they're doing for the network immediately becomes apparent that they aren't participating. So, I mean, one of the first big things is that you can have thousands of node operators that can run um, off-chain computations around data delivery or, or anything else, but they themselves will never know the computations they're doing, and, and therefore there's a greater, greater assurance that the computation is secure, reliable, private, you know, things like that. The next thing that's immediately useful is credential management. So basically, let's say you had a payment mechanism and you wanted to be assured that the payment mechanism was reliable and you wanted to give it credentials that can do payments, right? Credentials that allow you to send money. Uh, the storing of credentials that can send money is an important thing because if you have those credentials, you can start sending money. And so putting them in a secure, reliable uh, environment is, in our opinion, useful. So. You, you can get additional assurance that the credentials that people are using to do payments, either as a service provider or a third party or whoever, are in a reliable um, environment. And it even allows people to provide, to give their credentials to other people for them to do things for them if, if they want. Now, the third thing that's particularly interesting is that within a trusted execution environment, you can control private keys. So what that means is that if, uh, you know, a chain link that uses the town crier approach sees that a contract wants to pay in Bitcoin, then th that Intel SGX enclave can have a private key that can sign a Bitcoin multi-signature or another chain's multi-signature. So basically what this allows, it extends the capabilities of contracts on one chain to sign transactions, you know, plain transactions or multi-signature transactions on other chains to do things like payments. So it, it, it basically immediately extends their functionality to, you know, without any particular integration or any, any large amounts of work, I want my contract from Ethereum to send Bitcoin payments. I want, to, I want the private key related to that to be in a very secure environment. Uh, th th this is probably the approach you would use. 
The next thing that we see that's particularly interesting is that people can now write contracts in two parts. So people can write part of their contract on chain. So let's say you have a piece of the contract that you want to use for information sharing purposes and some kind of reconciliation, and you want many people to know about it. But then you have other parts of the contract that you want to keep private, either because they should be kept private or because maybe the, the capabilities of the network don't allow them to, to function in the network. In any case, what what an Oracle network like this provides is basically a layer two place that you can run that off-chain code on however many nodes you feel is, is needed. Five nodes, 10 nodes, 15, 20 nodes. So, you know, however many nodes you want to purchase to run the off-chain piece of your contract, it can be run in this environment and it can be done so privately. So that if you give your off-chain off -chain smart, the, the piece of your contract you want to run off-chain, it can run in a way that even the node operators would not know what, what that code was. This also really helps for scalability. So maybe you have computations or you have the off-chain piece of your contract that can't function on-chain because of simple limitations. And uh, the other thing that's very useful is you, have, you can run entire pieces of well-tested software right in a trusted execution environment. And I, I'll, I'll just walk through a quick example to, to maybe describe why, why that might be useful. So let's say you had something like a lottery contract, which is actually a decent amount of mainnet traffic, uh, as far as we can tell. And that lottery contract would need randomness. So it would need randomness that says, uh, you know, who wins in a way that isn't particularly gameable. That is essentially 50% of what the thing does, right? 50% is it takes people's bets, and 50% is it delivers a random result that chooses a winner. So literally, in this case, 50% of the contract's value, or the what, what, what it does is value is, is tied into this delivery of randomness. Now you can get that randomness from some third party web service or an API via middleware or something like that. But the better approach might be if you have a trusted execution environment and you put a library that can generate randomness in that environment and you use the, you know, the core entropy delivering mechanisms of that environment to, to, to create randomness, then all of a sudden you have an, a trusted execution environment generating randomness from a library you've evaluated that you know has been used for like 40, 50 years to generate randomness. And that um, trusted execution environment is then providing that data back into your contract. Uh, really, I don't, if somebody has like a more reliable way to generate randomness for lottery contracts, I'm glad to talk about it. There's other approaches, but I can tell you that this is on, on the, like the level of what you can do to generate randomness into a gambling or lottery contract, this is extremely high. Now let's say you felt comfortable that you're generating randomness in a, in a good environment and it's reliable and, and things like that, but you weren't sure that you wanted to do that on one node because now you're relying on literally one node. Maybe it's your own node, maybe it's a third party's node, you know, who knows. The thing that you should be able to do is you should be able to say, look, I re people rely on my lottery contract because they know it's run on thousands of nodes. They also know that 50% of the contract's value or usefulness is derived from this, the, the correct delivery of randomness into this other system. I want to assure them that the delivery of randomness I'm going to do is reliable enough that they should still rely on my lottery contract. At that point, you can purchase however many oracles you want to d deliver to, to you and your users guarantees about the reliability of this critical input for your contract to be considered reliable. This is, of course, assuming that people look at that, which we're assuming that once real money, like even now people are looking at lottery contracts and gaming them. Like more money shows up, people start knocking on things, and this becomes extremely important because how you trigger contracts with external events determines basically how secure they are. Then you could be in a situation where you want the, the contract to pay. Let's say you wanted to pay out people in Bitcoin. You know, it's an Ethereum lottery contract, but you wanted to pay the, them in Bitcoin or retail payments or something else. Uh, then Chainlinks would also be useful and you would want some additional level of assurance from trusted execution if you could get it. Uh, so basically, yes. The, I mean, the, ju just to kind of recap and, and give us a brief outline, uh, the, the goal of our body of work is to, to create a reliable middleware that creates end-to-end -end reliability, so contracts are not just a highly reliable piece in the middle and unreliable pieces on the sides, so that there's a reliable piece end-to-end. -end. Our approaches to this are providing decentralization to that mechanism to the degree that people want to pay for it, providing various outputs for payments so that people can pay their end users in whatever format they want to be paid in, retail, institutional, or, or other cryptocurrencies, 
And then the last part of our approach is providing an additional layer of security through the use of trusted execution environments, uh, all of which we're kind of focused on doing for a very large collection of pre-made inputs that would make it very easy for smart contract developers on various chains to build externally connected contracts that are, 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 both, are both externally connected in meaningful ways, therefore delivering value, and extremely reliably end-to-end. -end. Thank you.